Welcome fight fans to the darker side of boxing season 2 finale. We hope you've thoroughly enjoyed this season as a whole and what a way to send this season off by talking about one of the great heavyweights from the 1960s and 70s era, the golden era of the heavyweight division. Today we're talking about Oscar Bonavina, the man that shared the ring with the likes of Muhammad Ali, Zora Foley, Joe Fraser, George Chevalo, to name but a few. One of the genuinely toughest, hardest guys you will ever see in a boxing ring. But this man also had a, another life outside of the ring. A life that would lead to an untimely demise. And this story is all about putting into context what Oscar Bonavina's life was like inside and outside of the ring. And of course that grisly, that grisly demise for Oscar Bonavina and how it all came about. Now, before we get into this episode, as always, with each episode, we have to give a disclaimer because there are always moments in here where we're talking about maybe derogatory terms being used or there's there's obviously victims that are, that are involved. And sometimes, you know, you'll hear us have a little bit of a chuckle uncontrollably. And it's usually because we're in complete disbelief about some of the stories and how they've actually played out. Now, if you are easily offended, now would be the time to switch this podcast off. But if you've been with us, for as long as you probably have, and you're at this part of the season, you know what it's all about, you know what to expect, and you're probably not easily offended. So strap yourself in for the ride of your life, Oscar Bonavina and his life story, right here on the darker side of boxing season finale. Johnston, I just want to know, before we get into this story from yourself, like your opinion and your perception of Oscar Bonavina before you got into the research for this and you started to realise the more elements to his life and his career that you knew about. Yeah, I always knew Oscar as the fighter. The, the, it's, it's a guy, obviously, Mohamed Ali fought Joe Frazier. We've done career profiles on both those guys. And uh, obviously, it, he, he he's prominent in their careers for certain reasons, which we will go into in this. But as a person, I suppose I didn't really know that the one interview I remember is the one with Ali where he calls him a chicken, which we'll go into. And that always made me chuckle. But other than that, uh, I'll be honest with you, outside of the ring I weren't really too sure so it's, it's been interesting and it's been a real eye opener in terms of the kind of character he was and I think there are certain individuals within this story that paint uh, a truly exceptional picture of what he was like I mean the book from Patrick Connor uh, which we'll speak a lot about uh, Mark Cram um, also speaks quite a lot in this uh, so it's going to be very interesting as you know as with every Darker Side of Boxing episode, most of these guys are a bit of an arsehole. That most of them are. Let's be honest. Out of, out of what we've done, twenty, not necessarily twenty Darker Side of Boxing on, on a, the individual fighter, uh, but we've had a promoter. We've obviously had boxing and the mafia, etc. But most of them do tend to be arseholes, and I think Oscar Bonavina was one of those. I think he was an arsehole, and that's that's the opinion I get. So it'd be interesting to know the listener. You know, when you guys are listening, let us know what you think of Oscar Bonavina at the end of this. Um, but yeah, it, it's an eye opener, as I say. There's so much. He's, he's Argentinian. It's, it's difficult to actually get the information we need if he was an American fighter. When it's in South America, it's a lot harder. But there is there, there's enough here uh, for us to paint a picture of what he was like and what his personality was. Well, we're going to start at the very beginning, like we do for a lot of these stories we start and we try and to put into context a lot of these guys life stories as best possible as we can and of course like you've rightly pointed out there's only so much information when it comes from the south american region of the world there's only so much that people know about certain fighters and oscar natalio bonavina well he was no different and he was born in boedo in buenos aires to two italian immigrants on september the 25th 1942 they lived in a working-class neighbourhood that is famous for the birth of the Argentinian tango. Oscar's father, Vicente Senior, was a tram driver, and his mother, Dominga, an Italian Catholic, she washed clothes and cleaned houses for extra money. Oscar Bonavida, well, he was always complimentary of his father's hard graft, and stuck up for his father decades later, praising his work ethic and reminding an interviewer that Vicente was too busy with other things to even watch too much television. Oscar was born with flat feet and he actually struggled to keep up with the other kids, especially when playing football or soccer as our American listeners will know it as. Now the whole Bonavina family, they loved the game 
as did many kids in South America. Although the family lived on the breadline, Oscar was always fussy with his food, and his older brother, Vicente Jr., remembered. In an interview, he said, you never touched food on the plate he ate from. He would throw away the food, even if you just took a little bit. He would throw it away. He was crazy like that. The family, they relocated to Park Patricios, now the headquarters of the government in Buenos Aires as of 2015. It wasn't easy for Oscar, who began having trouble with the kids in his new area. To help him survive on the streets, his mother directed him to Club Atletico Huracan, which had a football team, but also had a boxing gym. Now, as mentioned in Patrick Connor's book, Shot to Brothel, an urban legend circulated for years. Bonavina, along with Argentine boxing luminary Luis Galtieri, found himself escorted out of the San Lorenzo Athletic Club after urinating in view of the bathers and their kids. The incident ended Bonavina's relationship with Galtieri and steered him toward the athletic club of San Lorenzo's rival, Parque Patricios. Oscar, well, he was known as, as a bit of a tearaway in his teens, as, you know, pissing in front of a swimming pool with kids. <laughs> uh, he did those sort of stupid things. Uh, his large frame made him easily recognisable and he enjoyed the attention that it brought him and, and he'd become outspoken and quite brash amongst his peers. Now, while making improvements in the boxing gym, he actually worked in a butcher's and as a pizza delivery boy to bring in some extra dosh uh, to the family home. And it was two brothers from the club Atletico Harrican, who was one and Batista Rago. They spotted the 16-year-old Oscar Bonavina's potential at the gym and began training him and managing his career. Within two years, at 18 years old, he, he met his first love, who was Dora Rafa. And they stayed together for many years, pretty much all, almost uh, until he died. Now, under the guidance of the Rago brothers, Oscar went on to capture the Latin American Amateur Heavyweight Championship at the age of 19. And ended up on the cover feature of Argentina's boxing magazine, K.O. Mondial. The last Argentinian heavyweight to have as much potential as Bonavina did at this time and went on to feature on that the same front page of that boxing magazine was Luis Angel Furpo. And, you know, as if people didn't know, he would go on to fight for the world heavyweight title at the Polo Grand to New York City on September the 14th, 1923 against Shaq Dempsey in one of the greatest first rounders in boxing history. Now, Oscar went on to represent his beloved Argentina in the 1963 Pan American Games in Sao Paulo, Brazil. But he was disqualified when he bit the American fighter, Lee Carr, while in a clinch. Bonavina received a one-year suspension from the Federican Argentina de Boxo, also known as FAB, not only for biting, but also for embarrassing Argentina in their rival's country. Now, Los Angeles Times writer Earl Gutsky mentioned in August 1987 column, a then little-known Argentine heavyweight boxer, Oscar Bonavina, was knocked down in the first round by American Lee Carr. Rising to his feet and spitting out his mouthpiece, the frustrated Bonavina promptly sunk his teeth into Carr's forearm and was disqualified. <laughs> Years before Mike Tyson decided to do it to Evander Holyfield, <laughs> Oscar Bonavina, he was he was the pioneer of the bite fight. <laughs> it's great. I, I never knew that. I never knew that with Oscar. And it's, uh, it's a great little story. Not so great, obviously, if you're the opponent, Lee Carr, getting bitten by Oscar Bonavina, but... You know, in terms of Oscar Bonavina's recognition and his stature, well, it definitely sort of adds to his uh, bad man stature, that's for sure. Well, Bonavina, he told The Ring's Dan Daniel in February 1965, everybody asks about that biting incident. I don't mind telling. Well, the American was tough. I hit him on the chin. As he fell, he grabbed me. I tried to get free and he held on tighter. I was getting angrier by the second. Then I threw one and missed. I slipped. The referee ruled it a knockdown and started to count. I still could not get myself loose from Carr and then I did it. I bit him. 
Well, I bit myself out of the Pan American Championship. I have since been told by trainer Charlie Goldman that in the professional ring, a well-placed hard bite doesn't count for a point. It was silly, and that's that. One year later, when his suspension was lifted, Oscar took the chance, a gamble, and travelled to America in hope of making something of himself as a professional boxer. His hand was somewhat forced when he married his girlfriend, Dora Rafa, and they had a daughter, Adriana. Jack Singer, who ran a chain of restaurants in New York and Miami, paid for Oscar to travel to New York in late 1963. In exchange, Oscar had to work in Singer's restaurant when he wasn't training. He was later followed by Dora and their newborn, Adriana. Oscar must have made an impression in the amateurs because his first professional fight was at the mecca of boxing, Madison Square Garden, on the matchmaker Teddy Brenner's card on January the 3rd, 1964. The 21-year-old made his debut against Lou Hicks at one of the most famous boxing venues in the world. Now, in a 48-fight amateur career, newspapers reported Bonavina's amateur record as 43-2, which included 36 knockout wins. Pan American 1955 gold medalist Alec Matef a Buenos Aires native who fought most of his career in the United States, became Bonavina's trainer. And when Matif arrived in America, he fell into the clutches of the Mafia stronghold due to his manager, Jaime the Mick Woolman, who acted as a front for Frankie Carbo. Always gets a mention in these days, Frankie, doesn't he? I mean, even before that, obviously. But Matif once told Sports Illustrated, we Argentines, we don't mind being robbed but we like you to tell us that you are about to rob us. <laughs> <laughs> After just two fights with Oscar, Matif, well, he was replaced. We, we spoke just a little bit there about his, that was his mafia connections, but Oscar very briefly was with him, you know, two fights in and he replaces him in May of 1964 with the former trainer of Rocky Marciano, who was Charlie Goldman, 76 years old at the time. And he was known for being a hands-on, no-nonsense trainer. And they worked at Harry Wiley's Broadway gym. Now, the sports writer Jack Cuddy described Goldman as a biscuit-faced, despicable known and a <laughs> spry might. Ah, oh, the language back in this day. Oh, I must admit, if, if no one ever read some of the language, which can be obviously derogatory, don't get me wrong, but the, the writing is fantastic. So what a crap they come out with. But Goldman said things like, never buy anything off the street, especially diamonds, and don't tell them, show them. His, his analogy was training a professional kid is like putting a quarter in one pocket and taking a dollar out of another. Uh, so these are the card. This was his trainer. Oscar then changed his manager after falling out of favour with Singer because he refused to pull his weight around the restaurant and not following instructions like cutting his hair, which is a big part of this whole thing. We'll go into this. But yeah, a lot of people wanted to cut his hair and he refused to. Now, Mark Cram, when he was writing for the Sports Illustrated at the time, this is his words, which is what he wrote. Besides eating an inordinate number of steaks, he, as in Oscar Bonavina, was a financial and mental problem to Singer, who, after Bonavina refused to work a few hours in the kitchen, unloaded him on Dr. Marvin Goldberg for $7,000. Singer explained what was said about the sale of Oscar to Goldberg. He said, I didn't want to sell the clown to Doc. I did everything to talk him out of it. I even called his wife. But no, he was dying to be burned. Well, Dr. Marvin Goldberg, a World War II hero and dentist and judge of the uh, New York State Athletic Commission, was fluent in Spanish. And he was also known as the Argentine Strong Boy. And he decided to abandon his post in the, as the New York, in the New York State Athletic Commission to purchase the contract of 5000 from Singer. And he also paid another $2,000 to another debt that Oscar Bonavina had racked up. So I think we've already, very quickly, you're starting to realise that he's a, he's a handful. Now, Mark Cram explained his thoughts on the signing, and he said, Goldberg is a decent, misdirected individual who is enthralled by the glamour of boxing. He is the worst kind of amateur, and therefore a perfect target for Oscar Bonavina. 
The New York Times wrote about Oscar's third professional fight under new manager Goldberg against Wendell Newton on March the 10th, 1964. And this is what it read. Argentine heavyweight Oscar Bonavina, 203 pounds, won his third straight professional fight with a fifth round technical knockout over Newton at Sunnyside Garden, Queens. It was a scheduled six rounder. Bonavina caught up with Newton in the fourth and continued the heavy punishment in the fifth. At the end of the round, Dr. Alexander Schiff examined Newton and stopped the fight. Newton was not caught, but said he was having difficulty seeing. In May, Oscar knocked out Canadian Leslie Borden in the third once again at the Sunnyside Garden. Then at the end of the month, he returned to Madison Square Garden to knock out Greek fighter Byron Stomendes in just one round, who Goldman had also trained. The old trainer refused to work either fighter's corner that night. After Oscar's fifth stoppage in as many fights, Teddy Brenner contacted Lee Carr with an offer to fight a rematch against Bonavina as a pro, and Lee Carr replied, The only way I'll fight that so-and-so is if he has all his teeth pulled. Obviously not wanting to, to get another chunk of his uh, flash taken there from Bonavina. So Oscar Bonavina fought his sixth professional fight, instead knocking out his sixth opponent, father of the Hurricane Peter McNeely, Tom McNeely, who once actually fought Floyd Patterson for the heavyweight title. Now it was not a pretty fight, with Bonavina labouring his way through his toughest test yet in front of 3,000 fans. On November the 13th, 1964, well this was the day of Oscar's first headliner at the Madison Square Garden, and the New York Times, well, they re released a piece on the Argentinian heavyweight. And this is what the Times wrote. The Times actually met with Charlie Goldman while in training camp leading up to his next fight, and he said, one more champion, one more, and I'll call it quits. Goldman then said that he doesn't think he'll, he'll have to wait long because uh, he was obviously quite happy with how Oscar was improving. And that boy can hit with both hands. He hits harder than Marciano did. Look at that combination. Speed. Real good speed. He can't even get any sparring partners. He only knows how to hit hard. The New York Times continued their article saying Bonavina finished with the heavy bag and it ended his workout with sitting up exercises. Then he showered and rejoined his trainer. He was wearing a dark suit, white shirt and no tie. But his power was still evident. His neck size is 18. His biceps are also 18 inches. He wears his hair in a short beetle style. His face is slightly flattened from his 52 fights as an amateur. But he has all his teeth. <laughs> Quite obviously. <laughs> Bonavina then confessed his love for boxing. He said, I want to box. I feel it here. He said, tapping out his chest near his heart with force. At the press conference of his next bout on November 30, 1964, against Dick Whipperman, Bonavina said, if I feel good, I knock him out in one round. If I don't feel good, maybe it takes two or three. The fight was a non-televised fight, which drew a crowd of 6,000 now, so double the attendance, and a gross gate of 18,614. Two of the best heavyweights to ever grace the ring sat ringside, Joe Lewis and Rocky Marciano. The New York Times, who covered much of Oscar's early fights at Madison Square Garden, then wrote this on Oscar's first headliner. Until the late rounds, the feature was more of a foot race than a fight. The stocky Bonavina spent most of the time chasing the taller Dick Whipperman. Bonavina landed lunging left hooks, sometimes above the belt, sometimes below. Whipperman complained about the low blows, but the referee granted no solace. The fight went the 10-round distance, with the referee Pete Delia scoring eight rounds for Bonavina and just two for Whipperman. Both judges gave all 10 rounds to Bonavina. Sports writer Dick Young summarised the fight quite accurately by saying Oscar Bonavina, the muscle-bound Argentine Goomba, wanted to fight but doesn't know how. Dick Whipperman knows how but didn't want to. Now following Oscar's seventh win on the spin and a decent victory in his headline fight, a syndicate of investors decided to back him. It was a Broadway press agent, Eddie Jaff, and his protege, Tad Dowd, who 
set up the international talent and training, or otherwise known as IT&T, at $250 a share. The syndicate was comprised of a stripper, a jockey, and various sorts of other characters with the intention to identify and finance a young fighter's career, and they chose Oscar Bonavina. One member of the syndicate said nobody had to do any selling, everybody wanted a piece of Oscar. This meant he now had more funds for boxing equipment, and more importantly for him, more money to spunk on having fun. With investors on his side and Teddy Brenner recognising the attraction to Oscar, he decided to have him back as the main headliner at Madison Square Garden on December the 18th, 1964, against Billy Steven. Bolivino was a 3-1 to favourite, and once again, the New York Times wrote this the day after. When the end came, Bonavina had just nailed Stephen to the ropes with a solid hook and a smashing right. Stephen, though willing, was unable to defend himself. In the sixth, the referee Arthur McCante stopped the fight and his decision was greeted with boos among the fans. But it was the right decision. And Oscar Bonavina said after the fight that he hoped it would have been halted sooner, saying he thought after the third round that McCante might have stopped it. He added that he actually felt sorry for Stefan and that he didn't want to hurt him. In fact, he actually recalled that Goldman told him after the third, go out and knock him out, don't hurt him. This victory was the eighth professional bout for youngster Oscar, who was now being touted as an outstanding prospect in the heavyweight division and improving with every outing. He then headed back to Buenos Aires to celebrate with his family. He wasn't there for long because Marvin Goldberg wanted him back to sign for the biggest fight of his career so far. Goldwood wanted Bonavina to fight against top 10 veteran Zora Foley on February the 26th. It wasn't easy getting him back though. It took Teddy Bremner to up his offer from $5,000 to $7,000 and then obviously those extra $2,000 Oscar then accepted without any fuss but told Goldberg that he needed to get his cut elsewhere. So he wasn't going to give him any of that 7,000 he was going to get. Now, while training for the biggest fight of his career to date, Oscar just never had the appetite or the concentration to listen to any advice. Lester Brunberg witnessed Bonavina taking the absolute piss out of Goldman when he was trying to pass on his wisdom. So he's in the ring sparring and he's got his hands up trying to teach him sort of the peekaboo style. And as he's walking forward, Oscar just keeps tripping him up and laughing. And the kid's falling over and all his mates are sort of sitting ringside. Just mugged him off, basically. Now, even Teddy Bremner warned Goldberg, tell him he'll get his head knocked off if he doesn't learn those things Charlie has been trying to teach him. Goldberg responded, what do you suppose I hired Goldman for originally? I wanted the best teacher. But who can get Bonavina to listen? I can't. Into the fight and the Associated Press wrote, Zora Foley punctured the Oscar Bonavina balloon Friday night by soundly drubbing the previously unbeaten Argentinian heavyweight in a one-sided 10-rounder at MSG. Foley floored the bullneck youngster in the 8th round, staggering him in two other rounds and won from here to Buenos Aires. Bonavina told the press in simple terms afterwards, me no good, he good. Goldberg admitted his miscalculation of matching his fighter with the experienced Foley and said, I goofed. I thought Foley was all washed up. I thought Foley would tire and Oscar would be able to nail him. It's my fault Oscar's not ready yet. I guess it's back to lesser opposition for a while. Well, I'm not surprised when he's dicking around in the gym that he lost to Zora Foley. I mean, we did Zora yeah. Foley's life and career in an earlier episode of the season and he wasn't a mug. This guy could have been so much more and yeah, he lost his dedication and his enthusiasm for the sport as the years went on but he was no mug. And yes, was he overmatched with him at that time? It sounds very much so. Now, although Bonavina received his two-thirds share of his purse immediately, his manager's one-third share was held up by the New York State Athletic Commission while they investigated the distribution of the shares in an IT&T syndicate. Bonavina wasn't bothered. He travelled back home to where he was a little more loved and had more money to spend. He loved being home so much that he decided to stay in Argentina and train under the Rago brothers again in March 1965 
and he would stay in Buenos Aires for the next 15 months, returning to the States in the summer of 1966. He would fight 13 times in the Argentinian capital and four times at their mecca of boxing, the Luna Park Arena. The Argentine Boxing Commission were called the Federación Argentina de Boxeo, again, as known as FAB, who Goldberg had a strained relationship with, but was forced to work closely with them while continuing to manage Oscar from a distance. After flattening six soft touches, all Argentinians in five months, Oscar Bonavina now had a career record of 14-1 and one with 13 knockouts. In his second appearance at the Luna Park Arena, he was matched with his first stiffest test in Zara Foley, and that was Gregorio Peralta. And Peralta, well, he was considered as an Argentinian hero amongst his nation, whereas Bonavena was not only still disliked for the bite, biting incident and his disqualification for the Pan American Games by some factions of the fans, he showed disrespect to Peralta. Oscar said that if he did eventually step into the ring with him, he was going to kill him and take the Argentine heavyweight title. That comment merged with his disgraceful actions in the Pan Ams on rival turf made him the bad guy. The Argentinians loved Peralta for his gentlemanly conduct and professionalism, whereas Oscar was the complete opposite. He received death threats and hate mail for saying he would kill the former light heavyweight world challenger. Undeterred by the animosity, Oscar continued to trash talk at the press conference, saying, Peralta, you're fighting El Chuco tonight. Say goodbye because I'm tearing off your head. In front of a gate of 25,236 at Luna Park for the Argentine heavyweight title, Bonavina started slow, but dropped the fan favourite in the fifth of a left hook to the chin. The valiant challenger managed to survive the round and finish the fight, but Bonavina won a comfortable unanimous decision. In a later interview with El Grafico, Bonavina said Peralta said he was going to trash talk me back to me. Then later on, he was quiet. After the fight, I invited him to come to my house and eat my mum's ravioli and he didn't show up. What a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> Oscar defeated two more soft touches in October 1965 before getting a fight with the American Billy Daniels once again at Luna Park. Now back to Arthur Patrick Connor and he explains how fighters like Daniels were tempted over to Buenos Aires and guys like Bonavino were able to actually get a head start in America and he says Tino Pozio, head trainer at Luna Park and legendary Argentine promoter Tito Lecture had a deal in place with, manage- with manager Charlie Johnston, head of the New York Boxing Managers Guild. Johnston had the experience bringing fighters like Archie Moore, Kid Gavilan and Sandy Sadler, all of whom he managed to fight at Luna Park. The deal allowed talent to funnel both ways to the benefit of all involved. American fighters provided a novel attraction for the growing crowds at Luna Park and the popular Argentine fighters could, in theory, earn a title shot in the United States. Lecture also tried to convert Argentine boxing fans' opinions on Oscar by encouraging El Grafico Argentina's most popular sports magazine to feature Bonavina on its cover regularly. Oscar got his nickname Ringo after the Beatles drummer because of his Beatles haircut and due to his fame in both Argentina and the United States. According to Carlos Irusta, author and long-time writer for El Grafico, Bonavina told him that he encountered a group of teens who saw him as he was leaving the hotel during his first visit to the United States and they yelled, Ringo! at him and he decided to roll with it. He went one further at the end of 1965 when he released a rock single called P.O. P.O. Pa in an attempt to mimic a Beatles song. It wasn't great, yet in Argentina it actually still almost sold 20,000 copies in two weeks. New York Daily News writer Dick Young first referred to Bonavina as Ringo in his article Ringo of the Ring, which featured a cartoon of Bonavina drawn by the artist Bill Gallo. Now, both had shares in ITNT, so it seems more logical that they coined the nickname to give Bonavina more exposure in the States. And just to round off there, Billy Daniels does get knocked out in just one round in Luna Park, and he has another fight after that, wins in a knockout in two. 
In March of 1966, uh, Bonavina took on Jose Giorgetti at the Estadio Bristo in Buenos Aires and was disqualified for repeated low blows, as suggested by the newspaper reports. Although Oscar tells a different story, saying that when he put Giorgetti to the canvas with a legal punch, the referee confused, took Bonavina to the neutral corner and began examining him instead. As that happened, the bell to end the eighth round rang and Giorgetti came to life before saying he could no longer continue. Now, the immediate rematch did take place a month later at Luna Park, and this time Oscar won a decision over 12 rounds. Bonavina was now 20-2 and two by the summer of 1966, and he finally left Argentina for the United States when he was given an opportunity to fight the Canadian George Chavalo at Madison Square Garden in New York. At first, he was unsure of a return to the States, but the $10,000 purse tempted him back, as, as all money do, does with Oscar Bonavina, although United Press International wrote this on the fight. Oscar Bonavina used his left hook like a buzzsaw to chop down George Tavalo for a majority 10-round decision. Although there were no knockdowns in the fight, Bonavina, a 9-5 underdog, staggered Chavalo in the second and the fourth rounds and even claimed to have inflicted the first knockdown of the Canadian's career in the fourth. Bonavina drove Chavalo back onto his haunches in the fourth with a series of rights to the head. And were it not for the ropes, which checked his backward lurch, Chavalo might have hit the canvas. Oscar said after the fight, I did knock him down, even though they didn't count it a knockdown. Many ringside observers felt Chavalo had done enough to get the decision, but Oscar got the verdict. And after the fight, he kept repeating Patterson and Clay all in one day. He started to mimic, <laughs> <laughs> he started to mimic, mimic Muhammad Ali, and we'll, we'll pick that up as we go along. Well, a few nights after Oscar's win, Ernie Terrell and Doug Jones fought in Houston for the WBA heavyweight title after they had stripped Muhammad Ali for signing to fight Sonny Liston in a rematch. Ali was at the fight and afterwards he was with fans signing autographs when Bonavina walked down the aisle and shoved his hand into Ali's and said, go to Europe, then come to South America and fight me. Ali dismissed Bonavina outright and said something about the Argentine being crazy. Bonavina retreated to Buenos Aires, but this time Brenner, Teddy Brenner, followed him to discuss terms for a fight with the new up-and-coming heavyweight Joe Fraser and get a contract signed. By early August, the fight was signed for September the 21st at 1966 at Madison Square Garden. Bonavina and Fraser both trained at the Catskills, the Argentine at the Grossingers, while the Philly fighter trained at the Concord Hotel Resort. Interestingly, Oscar had invested wisely when in Argentina, buying expensive cars, houses and businesses. But he was a tight get when he was in America. Apparently, he never spent a penny in the US. He made sure his management would be billed for everything, and they paid as well. For once, we have a fighter that, by all accounts, was actually exploiting his management team, rather than them doing it to him, which is a nice change. Oscar's syndicate had been made up of randoms who had sold off their shares already, whereas Fraser had a much more established group around him in Cloverley. He wanted something similar, believing that would get him a chance at a world title, and he said, fighters need lots of lawyers now. Every champion in every division had a lawyer doing business for him. That seems to be the way to win a title. A couple of bankers won't hurt either. And to be fair, he's he's probably right. Um, having a stripper as one of your <laughs> one of your shareholders, <laughs> I don't think that's gonna that's gonna bode well compared to if you've got um, you know a couple of lawyers or bankers as as we know Fraser had. And if you, if you haven't if you don't know Clover Lay, uh, Joe Fraser's career profile, go and have a listen. We we break that down. All the information's in there. And, but back to Os Oscar, and Oscar Bonavina refused to fight over more money issues. He did the same in another fight previously and got extra money for it. He did the same for the Fraser fight and once again he got the extra funds uh, and they were added onto his check. So uh, I think I believe it was the day before it may have even been a press he said I ain't fighting unless you give me more money and they give him like an extra few grand. Well the New York State 
Athletic Commission requested that Bonavina, again, this keeps coming up, cut his hair before fighting Frazier. But his response was classic. And when it when he told the Associated Press reporter, the commission gets me angry. They want me to cut my hair. I tell them I am like Samson. If I cut my hair, I will lose my strength. <laughs> The United Press International wrote on September the 22nd, 1966, ball like Oscar Bonavina, the burly plodding fighter with a big mop of hair who calls himself Ringo and the South American Beatle, has left Joe Frazier with the weary memories of a hard day's night. Bonavina decked Frazier twice in the second round, but couldn't keep him there. Now, if Bonavina had put Frazier down a third time, he would have gone on to win that fight by a free knockdown rule, which was applied for the fight. And it's something they applied back then. Knock him down three rounds in the same round, the fighter wins the fight. And Bonavina was very close to doing that against Joe Frazier. The United Press International continued their report. Frazier came back gamely with a relentless punishing attack that gave him the close decision in the eyes of the judges although most of the 9,069 fans at Madison Square Garden who were Bonavina fans booed the decision the split decision as it were Oscar of course well he was pissed off with the decision and he went back to his dressing room he actually sunk his fist through the door and then flew back of course like he always does after a defeat back to Buenos Aires Bonavina was still the Argentine heavyweight champion when he returned, but he lost the title without throwing a punch. To spice up the heavyweight division over in Argentina, in his home nation, he attended the Eduardo Coletti and Jose Giochetti fight at Luda Park. At some point during the show, he entered the ring and began to trash talk the fighters. The fab Well, they were unhappy with his conduct, so they stripped him of his title for unruly and unsportsmanlike attitudes. He just doesn't give a shit, does he? Like, he just doesn't care. He's (laughs) like, I will go back home and I will step into this ring and I will say what I want. I am the man. That is what he's saying. He's making a statement. (laughs) But it backfires on him. He loses his his Argentinian heavyweight title as a result of that. Well, while he was back in Argentina, he rolls off a nine-fight winning sequence against modest opponents, which is a trend we've already gone through. He stops eight of them. He's... Most two notable opponents were actually American, Amos Johnson, winning a 12-round decision in Luna Park, and his rubber match with Jose Giagetti, knocking out his rival in nine rounds on January the 21st, 1967. Just before Muhammad Ali went into exile in March of 1967, Oscar Bonavina had accepted a $75,000 offer to fight the heavyweight champion. The location and date were confirmed as Tokyo, Japan on May the 27th. Bonavina, probably speaking through an interpreter, told the New York Times, The proposal is satisfactory because I had asked for $80,000 on the purse. I want the money deposited in the bank to my name before the fight. Bonavina, at this point, is only 24 years of age still and he was eager to travel to Tokyo early and he said, It is the fight of my life and I don't want to leave any loose ends. Well, the fight never happened because Ali had his boxing licence revoked for not going to Vietnam. The New York State Athletic Commission decided to act quickly and organised an eight-man tournament to identify Ali's successor. The first selected eight fighters were Joe Fraser, Ernie Terrell, Floyd Patterson, Carl Mildenberger, George Chevalo, Jimmy Ellis, Tad Spencer and, of course, Oscar Bonavina. Now, as we've mentioned in Joe Fraser's career profile... His trainers, Yank Durham and Eddie Futch, well, they decided not to enter, as did George Chevalo's team. Jerry Quarry and Leotis Martin stepped in as replacements, and the fights were made. Ellis v. Martin, Quarry Patterson, Spencer Terrell, and Oscar Bonavina was matched with German Karl Mildenberger for a fight on September the 16th, 1967, in Frankfurt. Going back to Patrick Connor again from his book and he explains Oscar's managerial situation at the time and he said Marvin Goldberg actually sold off even more of his shares to the IT&T the syndicate itself was broken up when the New York State Athletic Commission officials found that no one involved agreed on the terms of their contracts or how much money they were actually entitled to it was all academic Bonavina 
bought two pairs of everything, from boxing gloves and shoes to expensive gym bags and clothes. Goldberg was contractually owned one-third of Bonavina's purses, but the fighter would simply claim insolvency. Skipping town after fights was merely one of the tactics to avoid paying his team. This left Bonavina in the hands of Lectore and the Rago brothers. That was when he obviously arrived in Buenos Aires. You get the trend. He has a fight. Don't pay people. Skips it back to Argentina. Takes two of everything, whatever he buys. Uh, <laughs> that's what he does. That's just his, that's his motto. That's how he rolls. Now, before the tournament began, Oscar was actually reinstated now as the Argentine heavyweight champion. And while in Germany, his managers and the Rago brothers, they were kicked out of uh, Mildenberger's camp for reportedly trying to spy on sparring sessions. Then he had problems with the accommodation, but they still managed to get to the fight, which according to Nat Fleischer, ranks as one of the worst conducted fights I've ever seen in my entire career. <laughs> in place of a bell, the timekeeper actually banged a bean can with a padded mallet. I mean, have you ever heard anything <laughs> so crazy? <laughs> and no one could actually flip in here to think. <laughs> Bonavina scored knockdowns in rounds 1, 4, 7 and 10 and the timekeeper didn't even know how to administer the count until the final one. The disastrous bout ended with Oscar claiming a 12-round decision and moving to the semi-finals of the WBA tournament against Jimmy Ellis. Mark Cram of Sports Illustrated wasn't happy. He said Bonavina's win represented a blow to the tournament. To think of Bonavina in the company of Jimmy Ellis and Tad Spencer is an obscenity. <laughs> well, we know Mark Cram's feelings on Oscar Bonavina are quite clear at this point. He really doesn't like him. <laughs> he doesn't like the way he conducts himself quite clearly. And and you can kind of understand why, as an outsider, why he could perceive him that way. Cram actually called him a bully, and he said this of Bonavina. Everyone, mistakenly, has, at one time or another, defined him as just a charming idiot. The trouble is, is that he is not one. He is an unscrupulous beggar drowning in the megalomania who abuses people and he has abused enough of them to the point where he now owns a clothing store, a restaurant, a nightclub and a barbershop in Argentina. He is also somewhat of a vaudevillain and quite often in Bad Soden he could be seen doing a chaplain walk or an off to Buffalo Shuffle on the streets. That is when he is not accosting Harold Conrad, Vice President of Sports Action, with this refrain, Give me money. These are Bonavina's favourite words. Well, even if his reputation wasn't great in the States, he was becoming a fan favourite in Argentina. Bonavina flew into the Azizia International Airport in Buenos Aires from Germany and he was greeted by thousands of fans and he was even led home by a police escort. Oscar finally arrived in Louisville at Bud Bruner's gym to prepare for the Ellis fight. With it being close to Christmas, Oscar decided to walk around downtown Louisville in a Santa Claus outfit, not to hand presents out to children, but to challenge another Santa to fight him. <laughs> Which I, it's a great story. You can just imagine it, can't you? Oscar Bonavida, he just comes strutting down the street looking like Ringo Starr out of the Beatles in a Santa outfit. And he's just, and, and you know what it's like in America. Like, you know, our perception of America is like they really love Christmas so much that there's a Santa on every single corner when it comes to Christmas. You can imagine him just having a scrap carty with a Santa Claus on the corner of like uh, a boulevard somewhere. Oh, it's absolutely brilliant. It reminds me of um, Jingle All The Way, you know, when he gets the dodgy <laughs> toy from all the Santas. <laughs> he got that massive geezer with a beard. <laughs> when, I was, when we used to do this, I just thought, that's what I kept thinking of, he had this vision of him, challenging other Santas. Ah, oh, brilliant. Well, the Americans never saw the funny side of his unusual behaviour, and never really would. Now, to the fight, and the Associated Press wrote, Jimmy Ellis knocked Bonavina down twice and went on to win a tight, but unanimous decision over the pride of Argentina. Mark Cram summed up Oscar's below-par performance in his Sports Illustrated article, and he wrote, The bout provided Ellis and Bonavina with $75,000 each, and it demonstrated once again that Bonavina, who sometimes resembles a runaway beer truck, is paid more for courage than for talent. He basically had been outboxed and surprisingly outfought against Ellis, who actually produced one of the finest performances of his professional career. 
Yeah, and uh, there is even a moment as well where in the fight, he, he hits Oscar Bonavena and it looks like Oscar would have dropped to a knee and he automatically grabs him and Andrew Dundee says he just couldn't shake off Ellis's uh, sparring. You know, he was always a sparring partner for Ali and he just couldn't shake that off. You know, when you hit someone, you've got to let them drop and and to be fair, he probably could have stopped Oscar that night. Oscar was really poor and uh, Ellis was superb and he deserved to win and an emotional Oscar Bonavina, well, he returned to his dressing room with the dreaded feeling of a chance missed and told the press that he would be taking a few months off and would be going back home. He would remain in Argentina for the next 11 months and started 1968 with two knockout wins against lesser opposition once again. Then his contract with Goldberg ran out in March. He fought his old amateur opponent, Lee Carr, as well. Finally, I think he had a, his, his career dipped when he went into the program. So Lee Carr finally got to fight him. But this time, he never bit the American. He actually just knocked him out in three rounds with body shots. Now, there were only two fights that Oscar really wanted, more than anything, after that Carr win. And that was Zora Foley and Joe Frazier. He managed to get a deal signed with Foley and their rematch took place at Luna Park during the summer. Bonavina was the more aggressive throughout, but was dazed a couple of times and tired in the last two frames. Bonavina was given the decision by two judges, with the third called it a draw, winning by a majority decision, which was greeted with a chorus of boos by the 25,000 fans in attendance which was really surprising. And after gaining revenge against Foley, Patrick Connor explained in, in his book the two things that Bonavina needed to keep himself relevant in Argentina. And they were Luna Park and Tito Lectore. And he wrote, in an unprecedented move, Lectore conceded a portion of television rights to Bonavina. He also allowed Bonavina to fight for a percentage of of the gate receipts rather than fixed purses. The permissive approach toward handling Bonavina while groundbreaking from a a fighter's perspective backfired thoroughly. Acquiescing to Bonavina's demands and keeping him comfortable just made him grab for more. When asked if the Garden would pursue the Frazier Bonavina rematch, their boxing director Harry Markson said Bonavina wants too much. In the end, it was Lou Lucchese, a toy store owner involved in Fraser's career early on, that offered Bonavina $75,000 tax-free to fight Fraser in the rematch in Philadelphia. He, of course, accepted, but not until he was guaranteed all of the revenue from South American radio and film rights, his expenses paid for, and that Frank Sinatra would be sitting ringside for the bout. In the end, he accepted and it was reported that Oscar made more money than the New York State Athletic Commission heavyweight champion, Joe Fraser. Bonavina flew out to the States with about 30 to 40 members of his family, no expense to him of course, and began training camp with Hector Neski, his latest trainer at Paul Flex Pro-Am Gym in Camden, New Jersey. The fight drew a crowd of approximately 8,100 producing a gate of $206,000 at the Philadelphia Spectrum. The Associated Press wrote, Fraser opened cuts over both Bonavina's eyes on the bridge of his nose and raised lumps on Oscar's face with his relentless pounding. Bonavina fighting most of the way with his back to the ropes and his hands held high in a -a peekaboo defence absorbed a fierce pounding to the head and body as he apparently waited to get home one big bomb. He never came close. And the report continues to explain that the clumsy, muscular Argentine was warned for low blows in four rounds, the 3rd, 8th, 10th and 12th, and he lost the 8th by penalty from the referee. The flat-footed challenger fought back only in flurries until late in the fight. He kept trying to nail Joe with a big punch, but he was wild most of the time, and when he did land a good punch, it didn't seem to bother the champion. Yeah, again, he just resorts to those low blows when fights are not going his way. And uh, Joe Frazier give him a bit of a pacing. And and it's important that some of these fights, we do put in the punishment he takes at times because obviously there are going to be questions about certain, you know, stuff with the brain, I'm sure, as we get to the end of this uh, episode. So 
Uh, if you're wondering why some of the is, is a bit more detail some of the fights than others, it's because of that. Just to show you that he had a, he had a bit of a chin on him and he took some blows. The result against Joe Frazier was a shout. Two of the judges had Frazier the winner by eight rounds and the other by just three. While Bonavina lost for the fifth time at the Spectrum to take his career to 38-5, and five, his hotel room was actually burgled while he was in the ring that night as well. All the television sets and radios that Oscar planned to take home with him, because he always did that, <laughs> they were all stolen. He then did his normal disappearing act straight after his fights and went back home. But this time, the IRS chased him, demanding $63,000. That was when Lachise stepped in and covered the tax man and what the tax man demanded. Trouble was, when he returned home, he discovered that his businesses, which included the barbershop and the nightclub, were in tatters. The Argentinian tax men were now demanding money from him as well. For all the money he had managed to wrangle from his former manager, Marvin Goldberg, trainer Goldman and Lochesi, uh, refusing to pay his cut man 100 bucks for the second fight with Frazier and everyone else he crossed paths with, he was somehow running out of money. Goldberg actually went to Bonavina's dressing room before that second Frazier fight and was punched in the face and chucked out by George Wheeler, who was a part of his team at the time. And Goldberg actually once joked that Oscar does a great pantomime of the great fighters, Clay Patterson and Liston. And then someone asked him, do you speak English? He says, sure, 60000 70000 dollars <laughs> <laughs> He speaks money. It would seem, however, the jokes were closing in. On, on Oscar now and interestingly a victory over Joe Frazier if he had have won that fight would have actually brought in a certain wrestling promoter Vince McMahon senior brought him into the equation and he apparently guaranteed Oscar Bonavina a hundred and fifty thousand dollars or 25 percent of gate receipts to fight Sonny Liston which wow. is a very interesting thing I never knew of you you get in the sense here Oscar He's doing a lot of running, and the running, he's running away from all this, just you know, with with money and 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 materialistic stuff, and now he's getting chased by the tax man, uh, both countries as well. So, it's starting to close in on him. Well, before Oscar stopped Luis Faustino Perez in their second meeting in Argentina, a court official stepped in and seized Bonavina's share of the purse. Oscar later confirmed to the press that he had lost much of his ring earnings in his business investments. To prevent this happening again, he flew to Germany with his wife Dora for a fight against the Beatle boxer Wilhelm von Homburg. After a couple of delays due to repeated excuses from Bonavina, who was clearly biding his time for more money, he actually stopped the German in eight rounds. His next fight was a draw with fellow native Gregorio Peralta in Uruguay, then to end 1969, he won by a 9th round stoppage against Santiago Alberto Lavelle at Luna Park. He then returned to the mecca of Argentina boxing in January 1970 against Miguel Angel Paez and failed to stop the smaller fighter from landing right hands. He got frustrated and landed a low blow in the 7th, but Paez went down and was unable to continue, resulting in Oscar Bonavina once again getting disqualified, much to the delight of the crowd. Wins over Lavelle in the rematch, Jose Humberto Meno, Manuel Ramos and James Woody came next. Just before the third meeting with Luis Faustino Perez, who he stopped with a vicious left hook in the third, Bonavina told the press that he would be fighting the winner of Muhammad Ali, who had finally made his return to the ring after his exile, and Jerry Quarry. Of course, Ali won, and the fight had been confirmed for December 7th, 1970, but not the venue. Bud Trainer, a known local businessman in Reno, who also owned a gas station in that town, was a member of the Nevada Athletic Commission. Trainer offered to co-promote the upcoming fight between Ali and Bonavina with Chris Dundee, brother of Angelo. And Chris Dundee, he told Reno reporters he liked the city's chances of landing the fight because it wouldn't eat into the closed circuit sales. Ultimately, Reno lost its chance to Madison Square Garden when the Nevada Athletic Commission's chairman upheld a prior decision not to license Muhammad Ali as punishment for his draft evasion conviction. Bonavina 
plug the fights as much as possible. And it would be the race angle that he decided to use more prominently. On the street of Buenos Aires, an, an interviewer asked Bonavina what he thought about Ali as a rival. And Bonavina said, I have a big advantage. I'm white and I'm from Argentina. From then on, more than once, he called himself the great white hope of Argentina. Obviously referring to the back the Jack Johnson days. Bonavina had his fab boxing license rescinded for not agreeing to cut his hair again and for bad behaviour in general, like saying racist comments to Perez, threatening to shoot Lavelle at their weigh-in and saying he will never fight in Argentina again. When he arrived in New York, he renewed his boxing licence and signed with a certain Gil Clancy as his new trainer. During a press gathering at the Garden, Ali called Bonavina a beast and Bonavina responded by calling him a black kangaroo but that was nothing compared to the pre-fight medical inspection Bonavina asked Ali why you not fight why you not go to Vietnam you chicken chicken pip 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 chicken Ali took it in his stride before rattling off a few of his usual one-liners about how viewers had to watch this fight how upset Bonavina got him and so on and so on Bonavina then leaned in close to Ali and made a pained face before covering his nose and his robe and racially abused the greatest by saying, me white, you black, you stink. <laughs> the atmosphere in the room changed from a bit of banter to a, a whole nother ball game. It became a hell of a lot more serious and tense after that moment. Well, I'm laughing because, not because of the racial element <laughs> of it. I just think, like, again, I'm laughing in disbelief, like... Wow. You can get away with this at the time. It's like, yeah, well, this is it. Like, you think of the time again. It was 1970. This still, and even today, we always say this on the pod. Like, but still today, that racism still exists massively. But then it was just so, so open, ridiculously so open. Like, you could say it at a press gathering, and no one would bat an eyelid. Like, the fact that he's done yeah. that in there. And, and I have seen that press conference. You can see it on YouTube, by the way. If you've not seen it, you can pretty much see most of it. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see this bit where he says, me white, you black, you stink. I don't think I've seen that bit in the press conference, but I've definitely seen parts of it when, he, when he's challenging him about why he didn't go to Vietnam and when he calls him a chicken. And I have seen that element. And it, it is interesting to watch because it is a sign of the times. But it also shows how professional Ali was because he... He was obviously very for pushing this this racial line. He was trying to break this line, wasn't he, so much during the 1960s. And, and, yeah. and part of the reason why he didn't want to go to Vietnam was obviously he didn't want to fight a war that he didn't want to, had nothing to do with. And, and, and he made that stand and obviously he got punished for that. And, and this is the difference between the two of them. Like Bonavina just, you can tell, having heard the story up to this point, he just doesn't care. He doesn't care who he offends. All he cares about is his money and going home. Whereas Ali, at this point, he's trying to get his career back on track. This was his first major, major fight, I think, after his exile. Now, of course, Ali, following these comments, was rightly furious. And he started yelling, I'm going to talk to you as I whoop you. You should never start talking, not with Muhammad Ali. And Oscar quickly replied, Cly, Cly, you Cly, Cly? Ali angrily corrected his opponent. Bonavina then leaned in against and caressed Ali's face and he said you need deodorant but you lovely you maricon now if anybody's been listening to the series you know maricon is another word used as a derogatory term for faggot which is a word that's no longer used to describe anyone who's homosexual now once translated Ali began shadow boxing throwing jabs that ended just an inch or two from Bonavina's face Bonavina squared up to him appearing to suggest that they take it outside but Ali smacked his hand away. Bonavina froze and turned bright red before fainting a punch at Ali, who flinched backward. After the heated exchange, the New York State Athletic Commission threatened to find both fighters if they didn't stop their insulting trash talk, and they both did as they were told. Ali and Bonavina fought for the NABF heavyweight title, which was declared vacant following the retirement of Leotis Martin. Ali was guaranteed $200,000 against 32.5% of all receipts, while Bonavina was guaranteed 100,000 against 22.5% of all receipts. 
The fight was shown live on closed circuit TV in 150 locations. The fight was a one-sided victory for Ali. Bonavina was knocked down three times in the 15 rounds, forcing an automatic stoppage under the three knockdown rule. And it was the only time he was ever stopped in his 68 professional fight career. Mark Cram comes into the equation once again and he wrote this on the fight. I've never wanted to whoop a man so bad said Muhammad Ali while fanning his usual hysteria last week. I'm going to put some soul on his head. The head belonged to Oscar Bonavina. And whatever else Ali put on that massive object for 14 rounds Monday night in Madison Square Garden, it was far from soul. So just just, <laughs> just stopping at this point and just going back to that whole incident, like now I've had the opportunity to go through this with yourself and, and obviously for the benefit of our listeners, like, it's quite quite bad, really, what, what Bonavina was doing there. Like I, I didn't realise how bad and how derogatory he got and how personal he got. And I know, obviously, some fighters can get quite personal when it comes down to these heated moments, but that, that was pretty disgusting, to be fair. And, I mean, don't get me wrong, Ali had his fair share of insults back, but they were nothing on the same level as what Bonavina directed towards him. No, uh, I mean, that's the first thing you think of way Ali was with Frazier and some of the stuff he said to Frazier and Foreman. But it's different, you know, it's difficult to really read between the lines. I mean, what he's saying there, straight up racist and and homosexual against, ho everything's against homosexuals, you know, sexual, homosexuality, derogatory terms, no longer used, can't say that shit. Even back then, it's like, whoa, like, that's, that's not good. You don't say that, Oscar. But I do think that there is a bit of a miscommunication with Oscar. I think he lacked good English and he... I mean, we, we can't, it's difficult for us to actually, to, to, to show you how he spoke, unless you actually go and have, have a look yourself. I mean, if you want to see the chicken comment, I mean, that is, it's clear that he's not the best at it. And I think what he's doing is he's looked at Ali and there were like, go, like even when he was in Luna Park, he hit the ring into that, that when he was, nothing, no, what, no, none of the fight was anything to do with him, but he enters a ring to, to build it up a fight between one of his other two Argentinian heavyweight guys. And then he ends up getting stripped of his title because of it, because people f find it difficult to understand where he comes from. It, I think he, in his head, he's thinking I'm joking and, and it's all to hype up a potential rivalry. But in actual fact, people are, are a little bit taken back by him. It's like, you know, what Ali was so great at was able to identify an environment he was sitting in and he could work out whether he could say certain things because he was articulate, he was clever. Bonavina isn't clever. He's not clever in any way. He just watches Ali, sees all the publicity about him and thinks, I'm going to do that. But when he does it, it looks terrible and it sounds bad. I'm not trying to say that uh, what he said is just, you know, I'm, tr I'm not trying to allow, let him off with it as such but i do think his education of it and his lack of english i think it makes it sound difficult I, i'm rabbiting on a bit here but yeah I, th I think that's what it is i think the language barrier and the way he carried himself i thought it made it was difficult for other people to work out work him out as a person so, so carrying on with the Ali fight mark cram continued with his articles in the 15th uh long past its long past his prediction as in Muhammad ali's prediction nine is and, and his mind with his body worn of Oscar's inexorable crude rushes laid a perfect left hook on the Argentinian's draw. It dropped Bonavino and consequently saved an evening that can be critically called a muddled performance, but with a zinger of a finish. After the fight, the trash talk stopped between Bonavino and Ali and Bonavino actually told Ali that listen champ, I strong, but you stronger. Frazier, never you win. So I'm guessing <laughs> uh, it, it, it will beat Frazier. He then turned to the press and said, this is the champion, he no chicken. Ali said, it was the toughest fight I ever had. Uh, both fighters actually went on to dismiss the pre-fight issues as promotion and free publicity. Ali said he felt no bitterness uh, towards Oscar Bonavina. And Bonavina said, in my country, using the term black means nothing. So that's, the, again, you know, that's just echoing what we were just saying earlier. In the next five years, Oscar fought only 14 times. The truly meaningful fights during that span were against Floyd Patterson and Ron Lyle 
And both fights took months to arrange because Oscar Bonavina's demands and claims of injuries. He was just continually demanding more money than he should be getting. The first of those was on February 11, 1972 at Madison Square Garden against Patterson, who, and he, who earned 85000 Bonavina got $70,000 for that fight. The Associated Press wrote that the bout was marked by a few sharp exchanges and neither fighter appeared in trouble, although Bonavina decked Patterson in the fourth round with a left hook to the top of the head. Bonavina balled Patterson in the eighth, landing a couple of shots to the face for his tiring opponent, but Patterson appeared fresh at the start of the ninth, landing a body barrage and then scoring a sharp left hook to the head and a flurry to the body in the tenth and countering a hard Bonavina left with a right to the jaw. Patterson said he was elated with the victory, but disappointed at his performance after coming on strong in the final two rounds, earning him a unanimous 10-round decision over the scrapping Bonavina at MSG. Oscar said after his defeat, I think I won. I did everything I was supposed to. Patterson got the decision because he finished on his feet. I knocked down Fraser twice and still lost. You can't win. Oscar Bonavina signed to fight George Foreman in October of 1972, but the fight never happened because his brother-in-law, Roberto, alleged the fighter attacked his wife, Dora, and subsequently punched Roberto in the street in Buenos Aires a month before the scheduled date. Bonavina later called it a family discussion, and Dora denied anything happened. Although Boston promoter Sam Silverman, who backed the fighter, told reporters that Bonavina's marriage problems killed the Foreman fight, and the couple quickly separated. Six months after signing with another promoter and manager, Loren Cassina, Bonavina attacked a tourist and broke his jaw in two places in Mar del Plata, a coastal resort town. Witnesses told police Bonavina fled the scene and gossip hit the Argentine tabloids quickly, saying he was owed and not really a fighter anymore, just a celebrity. The New York Times printed on April the 15th, 1973, an architect who accused the Argentine heavyweight Oscar Bonavina of breaking his jaw in a hotel bar brawl last summer sued the boxer today for $15,000. Norberto Bombicino alleged that Bonavina hit him for personal reasons which the police said they did not understand. The $15,000 damages the architect seeks includes disfiguration, surgical and medical treatment and the fact Bombasino wasn't able to work for four months. Again, it's just, just getting worse, isn't he? Like, his his ego is just so overinflated at this point that he feels it necessary to be able to attack people, whether he's in an altercation with someone or not, whether it's verbal. He's a trained boxer, you know, he's a trained boxer, he's a tough guy and he's hitting a guy who's an architect who's probably never stepped foot in the ring in his life and I'm not surprised he broke the guys, John. I'm not surprised the guy sued him either. I think you're getting it. He's got all these tax problems, and now he's out of the ring and he's whacking people, all within a pretty short space of time. There is a, a an issue with CTE wise. I do think that there's something not right. I think he's taken a lot of lashings in the head, and I think now you're starting to see the result of it. He was already a little bit crazy anyway, and now he's just gone to the next level now. And and in late in 1973, Bonavina was not given permission to leave Argentina for a fight against Jerry Quarry as a late replacement for Ernie Shavers due to legal reasons and unta unpaid taxes. It's all just gone Pete Tong for him. He was eventually jailed for the assault on uh, Norberto Bombasino. Oscar said that he had just pushed the victim, but witnesses informed police that the fighter had harassed a young lady and Bombasini tried to defend her, resulting in Bonavina punching the guy. Oscar was eventually released and went on to fight four more times in 1973, twice in Las Vegas and once in Denver and Oklahoma. Those victories set up another big fight on March 19, 1974 at the Denver Coliseum in Denver, Colorado in front of 10,807 against Ron Lyle. The Associated Press on this said the heavyweight Ron Lyle batted his way to a 12-round unanimous decision over Bonavina in a bout in which neither man was able to put the other to the canvas. Lyle bruised Bonavina under the right eye in the sixth round and Bonavina's face remained puffy for the rest of the way. Where he was behind on the scoring, however, Bonavina came on strong in the last two rounds and both men traded punches freely despite being obviously tired. Ron Lyle said after the fight, He's a bull. He's more 
physical than Jerry Quarry with not quite as much finesse. Quarry was sharper, but Bonavina hit heavier and came at me all the time. Again, just another description there of what Bonavina was like in the ring. He was relentless, flat-footed, but took several digs himself. The next big fight that didn't materialise was against Ken Norton. But injuries and contract disputes, again, about money, put their fight on the back burner in 1974. In stepped another new manager in Jimmy DiPiano. And, and Oscar recalled what he was told by uh, Jimmy, his new manager, to a guy called Sally Quinn of the Washington Post. He said, DiPiano say, no drink, no smoke, no women. 15 days before I fight, I touch no girls. That's what, that's what he said. The problem is, is again, another thing. This is, again, suggested that he did like them young. He liked his girls young. They were legal. They were anything between 18 and 19, which has been suggested. So he, he was a bit of a womanizer, and he also loved a drink, as well as taking massive punches to the face. So he's not in a good position. Well, by 1976, Oscar was finally able to leave Argentina, and when he did, he would never return, heading to Las Vegas, Nevada, for the George Foreman versus Ken Norton bout. In the post-fight press conference... Bonavina heckled both fighters and threw more racial slurs at Foreman. His promoter, Cassina, lined up a fight for Bonavina through Bud Trainer, a member of the Nevada Commission and Reno promoter. The fight would be against Billy Joyner in late February. After the bout, Bonavina would move on to Albuquerque to fight Roy Rodriguez and then Ernie Shavers. It was Cassina who introduced Bonavina to Trainer, who had hired Conforte as a matchmaker. Conforte was not the type of guy who worked for anyone and he had every intention to make a go of it himself but we will go into that in a moment. The Italian-American was granted a promoter's license by the state of Nevada and he said now I can do things by myself I don't have to use other promoters licenses. The day before the fight the Reno Gazette reported Bonavina applied for a marriage license along with one of Mustang's working girls. Cheryl Ann Rebidu. When Cassina pressed Bonavina on the subject, he just laughed and denied it. Bonavina fought his last professional fight at the Centennial Coliseum in Reno, Nevada on February the 26th, 1976. And again, we go to the Associated Press and their description and report of this fight. And it reads, Bonavina floored Joyner twice and took a unanimous decision in a 10-round heavyweight bout but Joyner kept trading punches with the Argentinian to the end and got a standing ovation from the crowd of 1,200. Bonavina sent Joyner to his haunches for an eight count in the second round with a left to the head and in the seventh round connected with a left to the body that dropped Joyner on his face. Joyner got up at the count of nine and referee Mills Lane looked in his eyes and let the fight go on, but the round ended almost immediately with Joyner staggering. Well, the day after defeating Joyner by a unanimous decision, Bonavina refused to sign a new contract and leave with uh, Cassina for Albuquerque, as the plan was. Conforte bought Bonavina's contract and assigned his wife, Sally, as his new manager. Bonavina told a local reporter, there are different people here than anywhere in the country. It's not like Los Angeles. I have more friends here. Maybe I buy a house. How much Oscar actually knew about the new management team that he had acquired at this time of signing the contract is unknown. But this is a brief background on Joe Conforte and his wife, Sally. Now, Joe was a struggling brothel owner who had done time in prison at the Terminal Island in California in 1962 for tax evasion. He was later moved to the New Island uh, prison because, as he put it, he was causing too much trouble. A guy like me goes to prison and you have it about as good as you can get it. When in McNeil Island, Washington, Conforte said he ran prison scams and paid other prisoners to work for him inside. He claimed his cellmates at McNeil Island included disgraced Teamster President Dave Beck, notorious gangster Alvin Creepy Carpis, and of course Frankie Carbo, who some have also suggested that Conforte and Carbo have had a few conversations and Conforte liked how Carbo did things and maybe 
tried to go into the boxing field because of him. Conforte was actually released from prison in 1966. He was not your quiet kind of criminal. He was very public and open about his links with prostitution, but not about his links with murders. Although the local gangsters and law enforcement officers saw him as a mafia don of Reno. He was also accessible with the press and stepped in to take over a brothel in Reno along with his wife, Sally, and they renamed it the Mustang Bridge Ranch or Mustang Ranch for short. In December of 1968, Mustang Ranch caught fire with the estimated damage at $100,000. Conforte was able to repair and reopen, but in April 1970, a taxi driver was found murdered on the road just outside Conforte's Mustang brothel. Later that year, the Reno bus line declared bankruptcy and Conforte put on a bid to run Reno's buses, telling the Reno Gazette, I would do it strictly as a goodwill gesture to the community. Reno has been good to me and maybe I could do something for the poor people of Reno, the ones who cannot afford to take a taxi. But the murder of the taxi driver put an end to that attempt and he decided to turn his attention to boxing. By 1971, the Mustang Ranch became the first fully legal brothel when Story County passed an ordinance beneficial to Conforte and his career in sex work, well, it was making him famous. Conforte felt untouchable by saying, anytime you can have a law, you can change it. It's politics, just politics. Those who are making money illegally in the hotels and from the street in Las Vegas, they have juice in the legislature to do that. Now we got juice in the legislature. I'm not saying that I bribe officials or anything like that. I don't bribe officials. But it doesn't hurt to be on good terms with them. To be on the right side of them. So you make sure the right people get in office. Conforte made out that he was making prostitution safer. And he wanted to be known as the face of making this happen. Participating in interviews with the Rolling Stone magazine. And anyone else who would listen. While he glorified prostitution, writer Robin Green portrayed Conforte as the hard, strict pimp. Girls worked 14-hour days for three weeks straight, had microphones in their rooms and had to be escorted by armed security when leaving the area. So you're getting a picture now of like what this guy's all about. He's he's a bit of a shit, isn't he? <laughs> it's as simple as that, really. He's just <laughs> he's been in he's been in prison and he's learned from the best. I mean, who better to learn from than Frankie Carbell? Do you know, like, who better to learn from it about exploiting certain areas and exploiting certain individuals? He had he had one of the guys, one of the original gangsters to do that from. He did. And, I mean, Conforte is he is, he's an Italian, born in Italy. And it, there is, a, you, can, you can see, if you put his name in YouTube, there's, like, a little newsreel on him. And he, he's walking about Reno with a massive fur coat. And, like, it looks like a pimp. It, it, that is his, that's his main source of income is to be le legal prostitution and he runs it like a pimp he's not good to the girls and anything went at mustang bridge ranch uh, there were cabinets full of sex toys and kinky outfits from whips costume lingerie you know belts nylons you name it they bloody had it An experienced working girl kathy explained some of her clients and she said there's some guys you can slug them in the balls as hard as you can and they won't move a muscle we get some can't come unless you call them a motherfucker <laughs> 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 oh, Kathy, love. oh brilliant well <laughs> a fire in uh, 1975 destroyed part of the brothel and thankfully nobody was killed or even injured Conforte was sure it was an attack from a rival of some sort, but with as uh, many enemies as he had, he wasn't quite sure who it was and it, they weren't going to be easy to find. So he was desperate to find a culprit. But with his ties with mob affiliations, it, it obviously had that reputation with the mob. The police never had enough information to arrest anybody. And to be honest, they probably didn't really want to press it anyway, especially because no one was hurt. But it was always enough from the police on Conforte to release to the press so they sort of flipped it he's trying to get their help and he's using the mob affiliation to find the culprits can't find them the police are not happy they want him out of the area to be honest nobody likes him in Reno they want rid of him 
Uh, so they, they haven't got enough to actually to arrest the guy, Conforte. But what they do have is certain bits of information they was able to give to the press, which to, just to destroy his name. And in the crazy world of Oscar Bonavina, this was the environment that he chose to be a part of in early 1976. It's obvious the booze and the women were his main attraction and boxing clearly wasn't. We already Someone already said that he was more of a celebrity at this point and wanted to be. He then purchased a trailer two miles from the Mustang Ranch and Sally agreed to help him gain citizenship and residency. Around May 15, Joe Conforte reopened the new Mustang Ranch, inviting 4,000 guests and spending $200,000 on champagne alone. Instead of, he, instead of dining with his thousands of clients and guests, Conforte left the party uncharacteristically early. Uh, leaving Sally, Bonavina, and 10 to 12 armed Mustang Ranch security guards. Among them were Willard Ross Brimer and John Coletti. Brimer reportedly met Conforte while doing time in a local jail, and Coletti was an old friend and former Bay Area private investigator who became Conforte's bodyguard after the 1975 fire now these are the guys that oscar is knocking about with and we already know oscar is very brash blase he doesn't give a shit that is not the environment he needs to be knocking around him well barry farrell for the new york magazine wrote brimer was six foot three 230 pounds a fist fighter an ass kicker a crowd control man he would stand by cracking his knuckles in embarrassment when conforte introduced him by saying this guy, I ain't lying, can take two heads and mash them together like cantaloupes. Conforte told conflicting stories about Brimer's hostility towards Bonavina, whose trailer was parked near Brimer's. Once he said Brimer feuded with the fighter about one of the Mustang's women, and another time he said Bonavina's behaviour at the grand opening sent Brimer into a frenzy. Apparently, Oscar walked around the brothel on the reopening night puffing on one of Conforte's cigars, Asking everyone, how do you like my new joint? Conforte was apparently pissed by Bonavina, daring to move in on his turf, and was convinced that Sally was in on it. So he banned Sally and Bonavina from the Mustang property two days after the grand opening, ordering security to stop them if they tried to come back. The following day, Bonavina came back from a workout to find his trailer ransacked and his possessions, including his passport, burnt. Bonavina and Sally drove to the Story County Sheriff's Headquarters in Virginia City, filed a complaint about the fire and mentioned threats and their removal from the Mustang Ranch. Sally later told investigators that from Virginia City they drove to San Francisco to replace Bonavina's burnt passport. Then they stopped at the Argentine Embassy where Bonavina wrote a message for Consul Aldolfo Nanclas and it said, Anything from here on that may happen to me be it accident or assassination attempt, can be attributed to the responsibility of Mr. Conforte. Sally also told police that they received a phone call whilst in San Francisco warning them not to return to Reno. When Oscar returns to Reno, don't come here, Oscar, but, you know, Oscar returns. He actually calls his wife, Dora Rafa. Um, she said that Bonavina called her after the San Francisco trip, saying his life had been threatened. And in her own words, he asked me to pray for him and to understand that he could not flee like a coward. She wasn't sure whether to believe him or not. And that was the last time that Dora would ever speak to her ex-husband again. Well, Joe Conforte told investigators he had one final conversation with Bonavina sometime between May 16 and May 21st. Conforte said he terminated his contract, told him to board the first flight back home and gave him $100 bills and a check of $7,500. A car dealer at the Sundown Casino told investigators Bonavina stayed there several hours drinking and gambling. Then at around 4.30 a.m., Bonavina took a phone call and left in a hurry, ending up in the car park of Mustang Ranch. Eyewitnesses were, of course, hesitant and inconsistent with their stories, warranted through fear and close relationship with Conforte and with Sally. 
But what was consistent among all of those eyewitnesses and there was their account of what happened in front of the Mustang Ranch around 6 a.m. on May 22nd, 1976. According to witnesses present, Bonavina parked his cougar, brand new cougar, a few strides from Mustang's front entrance. He then ran to the gate and grabbed the fence, shaking it and ringing the security buzzer. Sally's niece, Neva Tate, who was working on the security desk, she called for Conforte's bodyguard, John Coletti. According to Tate, Coletti and Bonavina argued for several minutes. Bonavina asking, why Joe not like me? In Joe Conforte's autobiography, which is uh, Breaks, Brains and Balls, he wrote that Bonavina told Coletti, I fucked Joe's wife and now I'm going to kill Joe. Wow. Well, it w- you wouldn't put it past him, would you? I mean, at this point, no. Oscar Bonavina's already said, I'm not going to flee like a coward. I'm going to go back and basically confront Conforte. And he's gone and he's tried to get to Conforte and he's been greeted with Coletti instead. And if that's true and he told Coletti that I fucked Joe's wife, well, of course, what's going to happen next? You know, it's, it's, it's inevitable, isn't it, that he's going to infuriate Joe? Well, back to Neva Tate, she then rang for Ross Brimer who first went to wake Conforte, but when he wouldn't get up, Brimer headed towards the security area where they stored three shotguns, but he couldn't find any shells there. Joe Perry Jr., son of one of the Perrys who owned the Mustang Ranch land, retrieved a .306 hunting rifle from the guard tower. Brimer grabbed it and loaded it. In Coletti's recorded statement to investigators, he said Brimer told Bonavina, Oscar, you're not allowed here. You were told to stay away, and we have orders to keep you away. Every account agreed that Bonavina demanded to see Conforte, but according to Coletti, Bonavina turned slowly towards his car, keeping his eyes on Conforte's security guard, and then began rummaging through his car as if to find something. A voice yelled, Freeze! And Coletti said Bonavina's head popped up as if the command got his attention, and then the crack of a rifle shot echoed through the hills. A point thirty six bullet entered Bonavina's chest directly into his heart. Going back to Patrick Connor's book, Patrick Connor wrote, when the bullet pierced Bonavina's heart, the heart literally exploded, as fluid-filled organs tend to do. There was never any chance of surviving that wound. Coletti said he looked up over his shoulder after the rifle fired and saw Brimer holding the gun although nobody would admit to actually seeing the whole shooting. Brimer calmly walked back into the kitchen area of the brothel and poured himself a bowl of cereal and a glass of orange juice. Now, the Washoe County officers and their SWAT team were the first law enforcement on the scene. By then, Conforte was awake and took control of the murder scene, while Brimer locked himself in one of the rooms. Conforte apparently said, So we got a dead man here. So what? Well, so there you got Oscar Bonavina laying dead on the floor and you've got the Washoe County officers and the SWAT team all there. Conforte continued to rant at the authorities while Oscar literally just lay dead on the floor. Unbelievably, the authorities retreated about half a mile from the ranch and waited for the Story County Sheriff, Bob Del Carlo, to arrive, which he did an hour later and there are also parts of some witnesses saying that someone is even out there hosing around him on the floor hosing up the blood while he lay on the floor that, that literally it is like a piece of trash that is you know a piece of rubbish just waiting for the bin men to collect him that is what we're talking about with these guys right now that is the sort of mentality they did well del carlo the sheriff escorted brimer to the nevada state prison in carson city where he was held without bail pending formal charges. And the New York Times, they reported this article the following day. Oscar Bonavina was shot to death yesterday at a brothel a few miles east of Reno, Nevada. He was 33 years old. Bonavina's body was found outside the locked gate of the Mustang Ranch brothel, legal house of prostitution, where the fighter had been residing in a mobile home since coming to the United States last year. Joe Conforte, the owner of the brothel complex, said he had planned to promote Bonavina in a series of fights in Reno. Sheriff Bob Del Carlo said that Willard Ross Brimer 
of Lockwood, Nevada, a security guard at the ranch was being held without bail for investigation of homicide. He said the suspect had made no statement. It will take us several days to piece this thing together, said the sheriff. Mills Lane, a deputy district attorney, said that Brimer faced charges for a previous incident in which he allegedly stopped passers-by at gunpoint, forced them to lie on the ground and kick them. Lane said that Brahma had three prior convictions on murder and assault charges. He wasn't a very nice man. Patrick Connor then explained the commotion after, and he said every day a new detail emerged during the investigation. Bonavina had actually married uh, Cheryl uh, Rebidu um, and had their uh, marriage annulled. Conforte switched the name of the brothel license application from Sally's to his, because obviously he had broken up with her at this point. The gun used to kill Bonavina belonged to Coletti. Uh, neither of the guns found on Bonavina's corpses belonged to him. And Bonavina's corpse had clearly been moved before the authorities got there. Wow. It just gets worse, doesn't it? Like, they literally did treat him like a piece of shit. Like, you know, Brimer yeah. just, didn't, just didn't give a shit. It's obvious. Like, you, you heard the description before we laid out the rest of this story to you, and you heard that Brimer was obviously this type of strong, silent type, but had this nasty streak to him, and that nasty streak just came out. As far as he was concerned, he didn't like Bonavina. He had a motive already because of the arguments between the two, which we mentioned previously. And knowing that Conforte wanted rid of him anyway, he just took it upon himself to kill him. That was it. He, he took the opportunity. He thought, you know what? Sod it, I'm having him, and he did it. That that must have been what was going through his mind, surely. He had a motive behind it. He had he had previous anger towards him. And Bonavina being Bonavina, being as brash and as arrogant as he was, well, it was probably going to be either Brimer shoots first or Bonavina ends up shooting. And that's probably what he was thinking. I can't say for sure he was thinking that, but given the descriptions and the, the previous incidents between the two, you kind of start to think this is what maybe actually happened here. Well, days after the murder, Conforte, Coletti and Bernardo Mercado all left town together in different cars. Reno authorities issued a warrant for Coletti's arrest as a material witness to Oscar Bonavina's death and tracked the trio down in Martinez, California, where Conforte owned a property and they arrested Coletti. The case against Brimer turned into a tax avoidance case against Joe and Sally Conforte, then an investigation into Conforte's bribes and corruption around Reno. Bonavina's death slowly faded to a footnote in America. On May the 28th, Oscar's older brother, Vicente, was the one who took a final sombre flight back to Buenos Aires with his little brother's remains. The next day, Oscar lay in state at Luna Park, where the ring would normally be. According to police, more than 150,000 mourners paid their respects by either nodding at, kissing or clutching onto Ringo's body, including light heavyweight champion Victor Galindez and even middleweight champion Carlos Monzon, who Oscar had a slight feud with. Every newspaper in Argentina covered the murder and then the funeral happened on May the 30th and he was buried at the Cementario de la Chacarita. Following a recommendation that Brimer spend 10 years behind bars, Judge Gregory handed down a two-year prison sentence. Fast forward to 1982, and under terms made public in the United States District Court in Reno, Bonavina's widow, Dora Bonavina, and his two children, Natalio and Adriana Bonavina, received $200,000 each from an insurance company representing the Mustang Ranch, a total of of $600,000 was, was the agreed settlement they won in a lawsuit against the owners of the Nevada brothel where he was murdered. Bonavina's football club, Atletico Huracan, actually built a life-size statue of him that sits in the stands and their supporters, oh, well, they've got a certain song. I'm not going to try and sing it to you, but I'm going to read out the lyrics to this song and it says, We are from the neighbourhood, the neighbourhood of La Cuema. We are from the neighbourhood of Ringo. Bonavena. And that is pretty much the lifetimes and demise of Oscar Bonavina, shot outside the Mustang Ranch. 
no fucks given about the way they treated him at the end. He was a character. He did a lot of naughty things. He wasn't the nicest of characters at times. But did he deserve to go out like that? Probably not. But he did. And it kind of just felt like this story came to a, an abrupt end. And it felt like it was always going to come to an abrupt end. If you'd have not known this story beforehand, and you know, you're know you relatively new to this podcast, and you're not so much of a, of a boxing fan, more a fan of crime and true crime, then I think you probably would have got the impression that this guy, Oscar Bonavina, was always headed for an untimely demise. And this is what happened. He couldn't help himself. He could have turned around and never went back to the Mustang Ranch. But his pride, his ego, took over. And he decided to go back because he felt like he'd be a coward if he didn't. And ultimately, that's where it ended for him. Because the people around at the time, the people he'd associated himself with, were even nastier uh, and even more of egotistical people than what he was and ultimately it led to his to his downfall at 33 years of age as well by the way you know you're forgetting that Oscar Bonavina was still a really young guy still had these fights lined up still potentially could have had a few more fights before his career ended and could have gone on to do different things outside of the ring I mean who knows it could have been a completely different story from the back of this but ultimately it was his ego that I think that got him killed in the end I agree. I think when you look at it, he was his own man, wasn't he? He he weren't going to get told by anyone, even down to the fact that people wanted to cut his hair. He loved his hair and he, he, he run things. He was never going to be one to be exploited. He was going to do the exploiting. And I think there was a, there's a major moment for me is when he doesn't go with Casina uh, onto Albuquerque. Uh, that You know, that was the potential. This go on to Albuquerque and then uh, fight Ro- uh, Roy Rodriguez and then Ernie Shavers. At 33, I, I think Ernie Shavers would have got rid of him because he was was half the fighter he was, and I think um, he was taking way too many digs. But what he could have gone on to add those extra two fights, and at 33, probably would have carried on and, and lost more fights. Probably won a few against those journeymen that he liked to fight. But that was a moment he decided he got wrapped up in in what Joe Conforte offered him. And, you know, even he said, like, the different people here in this country, it's not like Los Angeles and uh, I've got more friends. He actually considered these people to be his friends. These people were gangsters. They weren't your friends, mate. And he got he got the, the women. I think, you know, he gets, he gets taken. It's at this ranch. You know, he got all these prostitutes around him, telling him how lovely he is. He can have any girl he wants. You know, he's got a contract with him. He's getting a few grand. He he starts to believe that he's running the gaff. And just by acting that way, like he always does, he, someone takes a disliking to it. Uh, and a lot of people would have within the boxing industry, as we've clearly said, for Mark Cram, didn't like it. But Mark Cram isn't going to go and get himself a rifle and shoot your Oscar. And that was the problem. I think he just got his got involved in the wrong with the wrong crowd. And then, as you say, had an opportunity. It was in San Francisco. Just, just go. What are you doing, going back to these people? Because no one had ever told him no. And it, it, for him, you know, I'll have a fight of a guy, but maybe that's what it was. I'm going to confront Comfort, hey, find out why he doesn't like me, have a fight with him, and then patch things up. Maybe I don't know, but he doesn't realise in his head because I do think he's a quite, he's quite stupid. There's a language barrier problem, and I think, um, and he honestly does not believe he's going to get shot. And like you said, Sean, that Brimer sees one opportunity and he's going to get rid of him. And that's exactly what he does. And I think the other interesting thing, which I never knew, was the fact that this delay while he lay there on the floor, people washing the floor, washing up the crime scene. And the fact there was two guns found on him. They were two planted guns because he never had a gun. None of the witnesses ever said that he ever had a gun, just that he was reaching into his car for possibly a gun while they're holding a gun against him. I don't. I think that's all a load of shit. And I, I just think that generally that Coletto, Coletti was backing up his pal and, you know, he didn't want him to go down uh, and backing up the situation he was in because he's with those people. Bonavine is the outsider. Um, so, yeah, so many things there that, that just don't sit right. The fact they've planted guns, the fact that the authorities backed off a mile, half a mile down the road, probably because Conforte probably knew one of the guys that were there and paid them off. It was just, he was in a bad situation. I think he's, the blows to his head, I think, were causing him problems because he was a bit 
crazy in a way. I think it took him over the edge. And this is where we got to this situation. And at 33 years of age, he gets murdered. What a sad ending. What? Uh, not a very nice guy, though. Uh, I'm not going to say just because he was, a, he was a bit of an arsehole that he deserved to die. Absolutely not. I think he should probably still be living his life in Argentina, uh, like he said he was going to do. But unfortunately for him, it wasn't to be. And he just fell in in the wrong crowd and he got what, punished for it. What surprises me is that Brimer only gets uh, a really light sentence for a murder. Yeah. I mean, what, on, yeah. On, what, on, obviously, I'm not too sure what, what grounds it was that the... Like they sent I think it's the on. two guns, Sean. I think it's because they found the two guns on him. I think the only the only gun they found was a rifle that was in his boot, apparently, which I believe belonged to Sally, I believe. So it's it's not right, mate. It, uh, two years, that's lenient, mate. That's terrible, really, isn't it? Well, it is terrible. It's a ter- terrible justice being served there, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, we never really we never really went into the depths of, of, of Brimer in terms of what happened afterwards. Or what we do know is that, you know, he was recommended to spend 10 years and he only ends up spending two years. We never really went into the depths of what happened after to Brimer, whether he was he was murdered or ever, anything happened to him. We've not gone that far into it because this story is about Oscar. It's not about uh, Brimer or, or Conforte. These are just... You know, these are just guys that are affiliated with the story because these are ultimately the people he gets involved with at the end. For me, the story is all about telling the life of Oscar and giving you the picture of incidents that would lead up to his ultimate demise. And you get the picture all the way through the story that he had this really huge ego about himself and he didn't care where he was, who he was or who he was speaking to. He would always act the same way. He never changed. The one thing I will say is that he was consistent with that. You know, it wasn't like yeah. he, he tried to change to be different and around different people. He was consistently always a bit of an ass to people. And that's the one thing I will say about him. In terms of his in-ring career, could have could much more have been done for him? Maybe not, because I think he was obviously quite flat-footed, a bit of a plodder. You know, he was the type of fighter to stand and trade with you. Made it easier for guys like Muhammad Ali, who had all this lateral movement. Any fighter that had lateral movement against Oscar Bonavina had a lot more of a chance of beating him in a fight, and I think that that's kind of I'm not downplaying his achievements in the sport or what he what he did in the sport because you know his career uh, actually comprised of 58 wins, 44 by knockout, nine defeats, and one draw. So he's got a very very respectable career. He's he spent time in the ring with the best of them, you know, of of that era. It's a shame that he never got the fights with George Foreman, with Ken Norton. You know, these would have been other great names on his resume, win, lose, or draw. But it's it's just a shame that he was never able to see out the rest of his days as a fighter and the rest of his days as a human being as well. It's a, it's a shame. And these stories always tend to go that way. We've had Randy Turpin's story. We've had Zora Foley's story in this season. Now we've got Oscar Bonavina's. All eerily very, very similar in some way. You know, they were different men, of course. They were different types of human beings, but eerily very similar in terms of the way they, they their demise was so untimely in their lives and that that's it for see that's for it for our season season two episode 10 we're done oscar bonavina's story done and dusted it's been an absolute pleasure to bring this episode to everybody i hope that you have enjoyed not just this episode but the season there will be a full wrap-up episode which will feature myself which will feature yourself johnston and will feature luke all three of us will be doing a bit of a triple threat on the wrap-up and we'll uh we'll discuss our favorite <laughs> favorite moments of the episode of course you know the saddest story of them all where where we sort of rate the stories in terms of you know the the sadness aspect of them or you know sort of the genuine the genuine side of, of of these individuals i'm really excited to put that episode together obviously that won't be until the new year so please have a great christmas and new year for everybody that's listening at the point that we've recorded uh, for anybody else that's listening maybe three or four months down the line well i'm sure you'll be checking us out i'm sure you'll have enjoyed the season i'm sure you'll look forward to another season in the future but please if you have enjoyed the whole season you have enjoyed any particular episodes go online and let us know whether it's on the YouTube channel comments, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram, please drop us a message or drop us a comment on any of the posts that go out and do let us know because it is really appreciated and it it does help us sort of form how we're going to put our next seasons into place in terms of what type of stories that you guys like listening to. 
If you've not already followed us on any of them social platforms, you can do that either via the Darker Side of Boxing or BTR Boxing Podcast Network. Johnston, just giving you the, the final word on this one. Season 2, Episode 10, Oscar Bonavina. Final thoughts and final thoughts on, on this season as a whole. I've thoroughly enjoyed doing this season. It has been... Uh... It's been a lot of hard graft for the pair of us to try and get this on a consistent basis, and and I'm really pleased with what we've produced. Um, uh, I'm going to actually enjoy Christmas now because I'm actually going to catch up and listen to what we've put together. Because <laughs> if I'm one thing with me, me and you, Sean, is we don't actually get the benefit of listening to any of our results. We actually go on what other people are telling us. So if people can keep letting us know your thoughts, that'd be great. But we can actually now over the Christmas period actually listen back and see. What, what areas we need to improve on um, and, you know, and just give ourselves a little pat on the back, really, for being able to do all this. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, back to Oscar. I, I just, I can't help but think that um, he, he was misunderstood for me. I think that's the one feeling I get. Um, I would advise anyone who hasn't read Patrick Connor's book to go and do so. If you want to know the background, is he put so much information on Joe Conforte in there and, there's so many other stories about him um, and also the other guys like, like Brahma and, and you know, the guy that actually shot him. Um, and so if there's any, you know, if, if you like that side of things, definitely go and pick it up. It is a great book. And as I say, you know, it was our major source for the, for our episode. So massive shout out to Patrick and he will be coming on as well. We're going to have a chat with him or Sean probably will. I'll try and get involved, Sean. Uh, but yeah, what I mean, look, it's a fantastic story, isn't it? Uh, it's a sad ending. But I think what the one thing I will say of Oscar is um, I do honestly believe that there was a, a, an injury at some point, whether it was that Ali fight where he sustained several punches to the face that fight for 14 rounds. Um, I think there's always a fight in there, Sean. You just clearly made this. The, all of our dark side of boxing episodes for the second season have been a lot like this, where we've managed to roll through a guy's career and then there's been a, a really tragic ending right at the back end of their story. And they all seem to relate to, to, to decisions that they make in their lives that relates to what happened to them in the ring. So it just shows you that there are certain individuals that we watch on our televisions regularly that can take serious punishment and are able to come out the other end as a normal person and live a normal life there are the others that fall into this kind of situation and that's what we need to highlight box is a dangerous sport guys and i think you know how much we love it and and i do the descriptions of oscar bonavina and the beatings and the punches he took not necessarily beatings he was just strong and it's back to that topic of all the time of with fighters is it a, if they've got a tough chin and they take several blows to the head? Is it worse than taking the one punch knockout? Look, um, it's it's a it's 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 such a hard topic, really. Uh, and I think that to, for me, decisions that he makes in his life results from what happened to him in the ring. A lot of these fighters have been like, and that's what it's been for me. That's that's been a real eye opener for the dark side of boxing season two for me. That, that is, that's what stuck with me the whole time. So I don't know about you, but that is the one thing through all of them, Corrales, Turpin, Foley, even that they've all had that about them. And, and that just shows me, it makes me realize when I do watch boxing as well, just how fucking dangerous the sport is. Yeah, I think you're right on that. And I think that will definitely open up a conversation later on down the line where we could actually have a chat with maybe Tris Dixon, maybe we could get him to come onto our show and actually yeah, talk about his, about his book, about Damaged and about the effects of CTA. I think that would be definitely be something we'd be interested in doing because it would link into a lot of these stories. But guys, that's it. That's the season done and dusted. You will get an after show with Lukey. You will get the interview with Patrick Connor and you will get a wrap-up episode. So all is not done yet. Please, as always, as I keep saying to you, do let us know on social media. It really, truly does make us smile so much when we see these comments. And if there are any uh, improvements, if, if if there's anything you do think we can do better at with the series, then obviously let us know. You know, we're open to any constructive criticism. We want to make this show the best show regarding boxing and true crime. We want, we feel it is, 
but you guys are telling us, so we need to use to keep telling us and we need to keep shouting it out there <laughs> and, and sharing it with everybody because that's the only way more and more people are going to hear about it and that's the only way we will get more people involved and make it into a in, into a greater podcast. But for now, guys, it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from Johnston. We hope you've enjoyed this episode all about the life, the times and the demise of Oscar Bonavino. <laughs>